that doesn't know me, welcome. Thanks for coming. I'm Harrison Carmichael. I'm one of the fifth-year emergency medicine residents here in Ottawa. Um, you guys are able to hear me okay, just as where this is? Yeah, perfect. Um, based on the email that was sent around beforehand, I think most of you guys are aware that we're here to talk about what's being termed as a new epidemic in North America, and that's vaping-associated lung injury. As sort of frontline providers, I think it's really important for us to be aware of these topics, especially when they're so heavily covered in the media and in the public eye, that we need to be the experts in being able to counsel our patients, being able to pick these cases up, and really to be able to manage them appropriately. Um, it's really important to sort of understand just right off the start that many of you guys may have heard the term vapey or vaping-associated pulmonary injury. And the CDC decided that Grand Rounds wasn't difficult enough. And about a week ago, they decided to change the name of this illness. So they changed it to E-Valley. So I had to go through all of my slides and all of my notes changing this. So if I accidentally say vapey instead of valley today, forgive me. I'm going to call it valley for the rest of the uh, talk, just so that you guys know exactly what it is that I'm referring to. So a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. So first off, I'm going to outline the current landscape of vaping and e-cigarette use in North America. I'm going to discuss this new epidemic that we're seeing that's termed Valley. Um, we're going to learn to manage Valley, and I'm going to do that by drawing on some experience that we have in knowledge of other illnesses. And then I'm going to provide you guys with a framework for an approach to different levels and different severities of this presentation. And hopefully by the end of today, you guys will all leave feeling a lot more comfortable with how to counsel your patients and how to manage this disease. Now, there are some people in the room, I'm sure, are very familiar with e-cigarettes, very familiar with vaping, and I'm sure there are some people this is an entirely new topic. So I want to start us all off on the same page. And to do that, we're going to rely on the Oxford Dictionary. So what is vaping? Vaping is a noun. So it's, an action of, it's the action or practice of inhaling or exhaling a vapor that's produced by an electronic cigarette or a similar device. Now, to give you guys an idea of how popular this term actually is, in 2014, vaping was the word of the year as term dubbed by the Oxford Dictionary. So it's obviously prominent in our society. You might read that definition and kind of say, okay, so vaping's this, but what's an e-cigarette? And that's shockingly a bit of a good question. Now, again, relying on the dictionary, it tells us that it's an e or a cigarette-shaped device that contains a nicotine-based liquid that's vaporized and inhaled. It's meant to simulate the experience of smoking a cigarette. And that's a bit of a good question because these devices do not look like cigarettes anymore and are not limited to nicotine-based substances. So it can be really difficult for us to actually identify what a cigarette or an e-cigarette is and what a vaping device is. Now, to give you guys an understanding of where these devices came from, they came from some pretty humble beginnings. They started actually and entered the market in 2003 in Asia, and it was developed by a Chinese pharmacist. The intention behind developing this was because this uh, gentleman's father was a heavy smoker, and he passed away, unfortunately, from lung cancer. The pharmacist, a heavy smoker himself, wanted a safer option to smoking, and so he developed this e-cigarette device, which he thought would be a good substitute and reduce his risks related to his nicotine addiction. Because of this sort of beginnings, many people look at e-cigarette devices as a really effective form of nicotine replacement therapy, and that's a really common belief that's held true today. There's a bit of an issue with that, and the issue with that is that there are really no evidence to show that it's a very effective nicotine replacement therapy in spite of that belief. If you take the time to look into the research around this topic, it is really difficult. There are hundreds and hundreds of papers, and so many of them are industry-sponsored. You can imagine whenever we're talking about nicotine or the tobacco industry that there's lots of funding and lots of conflict of interest that come up in these papers, and you can see some really good outcomes, but these papers are not published in major journals, and they're not sources that you can really believe or trust those results. In speaking with our respirology colleagues around this and some people with some expertise in the area, they only quote a few certain studies, and one of them I think is probably the best is in The Lancet from 2013. So this study was done by Bullen et al., and it was titled Electronic Cigarettes for Smoking Cessation. It was a randomized control trial. This is out of Auckland, New Zealand. It looked at 657 smokers, and importantly, these were smokers who were motivated to quit smoking. They were randomized into three different uh, groups. So the first were free e-cigarettes, free nicotine patches, and then free placebo e-cigarettes. And their primary outcome was looking for abstinence from combustible or regular cigarettes at that six-month time frame. What they found with the results was that there was no significant difference between any of the groups. The primary outcome that was reached was about 7.3% in the e-cigarette group, 5.1% in the um, uh, nicotine patch group, and about a 4.1% in the placebo group. 
They made one big mistake with this study, and it was made right off the get-go. And what it was was that they overestimated the number of people that would reach that primary outcome. Therefore, with their power calculation, they really underpowered this study. They could have potentially found significance. There's a definite trend there, but they didn't have the numbers there. So we can't say anything other than that these e-cigarettes are about as equal to patches. Another issue with it, and another thing that we saw, is that patches are actually only a really poor form or moderate form of nicotine replacement therapy in isolation. Do you speak with experts in the area? The big issue with this study was that they did not compare e-cigarettes to a gold standard. They compared it to something that's just average. So all we know is that e-cigarettes are probably just an average form of nicotine replacement therapy, and we can't say anything more than that. Now, because of the lack of literature in here, some of our experts in the Heart and Stroke Foundation, they released a position statement to guide us a little bit with the use of these e-cigarettes. And it's really important to understand that this was released in October of 2018. So this is before we really identified Valley as a disease process. What the Heart and Stroke Foundation says is we agree with the Canadian Cancer Society, we agree with the Canadian Lung Association that e-cigarettes, they're probably less harmful than conventional cigarettes. Um, they're not without their own harms, but because we will do anything and recommend anything to get people to stop smoking, we encourage increasing the access to these devices. Now, if you look at some of the companies that market e-cigarettes, there's a common number that's flown around in, the, in their ads, and that's that e-cigarettes are 95% safer than cigarettes. Now, that seems like a very specific number, and it's really important to understand where that number comes from. The Heart and Stroke actually specifically addresses this in the position statement. What they say is that e-cigarettes are 95% safer, or not 95% safer than cigarettes. That's never been verified by any critically appraised evidence. Where this actually came from was a group of physicians in the UK who had significant industry partnerships and significant conflict of interest with the e-cigarette industry, and it came from their subjective opinion that yeah, these are probably like 95-ish percent safer. And because of that, these companies have latched onto that and used that as their moniker and used that to sort of inflate the opinion of how effective and how safe these devices are. The truth of it is we have no idea what the short-term and long-term outcomes related to e-cigarette use is. And maybe vaping-associated lung injury are some of these new short-term outcomes that we're starting to see. To quickly summarize this and then quickly summarize e-cigarettes as kind of that medical therapy, that NRT, um, they were designed as that with that in mind. They've been shown to be at least as effective as some moderate forms of it, but really can't be said to be any stronger than that. Many people who are using e-cigarettes, and this is really important to understand, they use it as a nicotine replacement therapy. They just keep using those e-cigarettes in these studies. So it's not that you're reducing the nicotine addiction and giving them a way to stop that. You're just providing a different um, modality for them to continue to use nicotine and continue to be addicted. And then finally, it's definitely not 95% safer. Don't believe that number. There's nothing that supports that. Okay, we're going to switch gears here a little bit. We're going to play a game. And I'm not going to play a Chris Mong game where you're coming down to read quotes about anal fissures from the 1700s. <laughs> Simply what we're going to be doing here today is I want you guys to identify the e-cigarette versus the combustible cigarette. So it's not a very difficult game, and I can presume that most of you probably thought that this was the e-cigarette. I hope a few people got it wrong and feel bad about themselves now. The next one I want you to do, so which one is a USB and which one's the e-cigarette? <laughs> it's not too difficult again. On your guys' right is the e-cigarette. The point of these two slides is not to make you guys feel bad if you got it wrong. It's more so to show a bit of a change in these devices. So that original device looks like a cigarette. It's designed to simulate the experience of using a cigarette. But now they've changed. They're meant to look more techy, sleek. You're supposed to be able to hide these a little bit more. So they're more difficult to identify. This is starting to get to extreme levels. This is an e-cigarette device or a vaping device that we can see. That cylinder at the top can be detached and you've got your typical phone case and whenever you want to take a hit, whenever you want to use this, you twist it back in and you can use this as a vaping device. Gets even funner with that, we start having these. Um, so in case anyone in here was wondering, yes, this comes in Ventolin Blue. And so you can understand that if you see a kid walking down the hallway at school, are they treating their asthma? Are they using an e-cigarette device? It can be difficult to tell. So. We're sort of talking about this. We've got these issues. These devices are getting harder to identify. But what are people actually using them for? So not shockingly, nicotine. Nicotine is the most commonly used um, e-liquid or substance that's being vaped. It's really important to understand when these actually came out in about 2003, the early 2000s, the e-liquid was free-base nicotine. Free-base nicotine is harsh. It's bitter. It hurts your throat. It's not a pleasant experience. So because of that, these companies started to try to figure out ways that people could tolerate this better, and they began to add things like flavorings. 
Now, there are many different things that are used in flavorings, and trust me, there are no regulations on this. They can put whatever they want into it. But we see common things like diacetyl, vitamin E, propylene glycol, and these are things that have been associated with other diseases, especially when they're being inhaled. Now, it's also important to know that this has changed even recently. They've changed from free-based nicotine to something that's called nicotine salts. These salts are much less harsh. They simulate the experience of smoking a combustible cigarette far more realistically. And when you speak with our respirology colleagues, there's been nothing that's ever been developed that's as effective as a nicotine vector of getting it into your bloodstream as smoking a combustible cigarette. So the fact that they're getting closer to replicating that is only going to allow these devices to continue to become more popular. Now, we're in Canada. It's the age of legalization, so I'm not surprising anyone here when I say that people are using it for THC, CBD, hash oil. But it might catch a few people by surprise and say that vodka is a very commonly vaped substance. So another way to get, some, um, to get alcohol into your system, and obviously this is something that can affect the lungs. And if people are using vodka, you can assume they're using almost anything that can be put into a liquid form. And that's really been shown to be the case throughout case series and throughout certain um, articles that have been shown. Now, why do we care about this? So we've talked about these substances. It's not a great nicotine replacement. It's harder to identify. People use it for a variety of reasons. But why do we care? And I'm going to talk, touch about two reasons here today. So one of them, the main reason that we care about this here today is we're going to talk about vaping associated lung injury, that clinical entity. But I want to give you guys a scope of the landscape and a scope of really the public health crisis, and I'm going to use that term crisis, for e-cigarettes and what it's become. And to do that, I'm going to talk a bit about smoking. So this is a graph here that's looking at the trend in uh, cigarette use in grade 12 students in the U.S. What they use is they ask students, in the last 30 days, have you smoked a cigarette? And they use that as a surrogate marker for kids who are smoking. You can see back in 1976, almost 30% of kids were smoking cigarettes. And through some public health um, interventions, restrictions onto the tobacco industry and their advertising, we've made some pretty significant gains. It was to a point where people were starting to say that the United States had actually beaten the youth smoking epidemic. And then you can see in 2017, it was down to 3.6%. That's pretty impressive. This gives a little bit of context to that. With your cigarette use, this is coming from the, um, uh, coming from the CDC, you can see continuing trending down in the cigarette use. But at the same time, that same question, have you used an e-cigarette in the last 30 days, you see this exponential increase. This is going from about 1.3% in 2011 to nearly 28% in 2019. That's under a decade. You've got a 1,400% increase in the use of these devices. This is something that we need to understand. Why is this so effective? What's happening? How is that going on? And to do that, you need to understand the timeline of e-cigarettes. So I mentioned to you guys earlier, Asian market had entered in 2003. It didn't enter the North American market until about 2007. Kind of stuttered along for a little while until 2011. And this is an important thing to recognize, is this is whenever money and funding into advertising for these substances increased. It actually tripled. Now, I'm not going to surprise anyone by saying this is about the same time that market entry happened for our big tobacco companies. And with that advertising increase, we saw increased awareness in adults. We see an exponential increase in the use of uh, these e-cigarettes by our adolescents from 1.3% to 13.4% in the three-year phase. And we see that retail sales more than doubled. By 2015, the market was valued for e-cigarettes at around $3.5 billion. And early estimates this year are approaching $30 billion for this market. With that increase, to give you guys a scope of this, there are projections that in the early 2020s, the e-cigarette valuation, the market valuation, is going to surpass that of combustible cigarettes. Now, you can imagine booming industry, advertising, getting young new smokers that are in there addicted to nicotine. Big tobacco is playing a role. So Altria, the biggest company in the U.S., the biggest cigarette company, recently bought a 35% stake in Juul for $13 billion. Now, Juul is a company I'm going to be touching on here today. And for those of you that don't know it, this is the biggest market share producer of e-cigarette devices in the U.S. has about a 35% market share. And Juul has come under a bit of fire lately and is really in the news because of this vaping-associated lung injury. In fact, their CEO recently just got fired. And to give you an idea of how much influence in the market right now um, the big tobacco companies have, the new CEO of Juul was a high-ranking official from Altria, the chief growth officer, the person who is responsible for helping bring another type of e-cigarette that's very popular in Asia to the United States market. So you can see this issue that's going on, and you can see that these companies are using e-cigarettes as a way to replace the customers that they've lost over the years from their smoking and the restrictions on the tobacco industry. 
Now I'm going to zoom in here again on the advertising, because this is something that's so interesting, and this is really the driving force behind all of this. This is an ad from a number of years ago. Now I'm not trying to insult anyone, but some of you may have been alive whenever this ad was running. There were even a few that could have been practicing medicine, no judgment, it's okay. You guys can see here, very nice looking young physician. He's got something that looks medical on his forehead. And I don't know about you guys, but I am exactly like him. After a big resuscitation, there's nothing I enjoy more than a smooth, long drag of a camel cigarette. And that helps to calm my nerves. But that was the point of these um, ads, was to give you an idea that the physicians think that this is safe. This is something that they use. This is something they recommend. So therefore, you can trust that these are okay for you to use. And this was an effective marketing strategy. This marketing strategy actually became sort of outlawed and it was restricted in the tobacco industry. And I think most physicians now know that this is an issue and they're not going to link themselves to these devices. So these companies have turned and they've looked at a bit of an alternative market. I don't need to give you guys too many reasons to hate Jenny McCarthy, our local anti-vax friend. But there are a number of people in alternative health that, that trust her medical opinion. In their eyes, she has the medical education that is equivalent to a physician. So there are a number of these people who are prominent in that alternative health market that are being tapped in to advertise these devices. And it's the same understanding and same reason. It's creating that trust. Now, we go back again and we look at a Lucky Strike ad. This is a very common ad that you will have seen from years ago. This is the ideal of society. Fancy dressed. You're out on, for a night in the town, you're attractive, you're smoking, you're relaxed, this is the cool thing to do. This is what you should strive for. Fortunately, again, restrictions have limited how much these tobacco ads are able to be reproduced today. But those restrictions do not apply to the e-cigarette industry. This is an ad for blue um, e-cigarettes, which was just from a, number of year, a couple of years ago. And you can see identical themes across this. If you look at these ads, you can see a number of themes that have been restricted in the tobacco industry. So things like freedom, having fun, sharing with your friends, sex appeal is throughout the um, industry. Relationships is also there as well. And these are all things, yeah, I know. Yeah, I don't know why that's an ad, but anyways. Um, you can see that these are things that people are gonna strive for. They wanna have fun, they wanna use these devices, they wanna make them look cool. Not only are they using strategies that have been effective before, but you can also see the populations that they're targeting. So this is an ad for Marlboro. This is, um, I think, just from a couple of years ago. But you can see that Marlboro knows who they're targeting. Somebody who is a laborer. They're going to be working on cars. They're going to be sort of that blue-collar workforce. These are the population that's still smoking today. If you think of the e-cigarette industry in terms of who they should be advertising to, they all sell themselves as nicotine replacement therapy companies. So that should be the 60-year-old smoker. He's got COPD, he's struggling to quit, he wants to improve his health, so you would think that that's who they'd be targeting. Instead you get this, bright colors, cool logos, a very new, sleek, tech-looking device, and again, sex appeal and attractive people in these ads. That's geared towards adolescents. That's geared towards a population that is not addicted to nicotine. It's geared towards people they're trying to convince to start these devices. And this is throughout all of their ads. For some reason, Juul puts all of these ads out. They are obviously marketing towards adolescents with the pictures of these people, and yet they will go on in the media and say that they are not intentionally doing this. If Juul, if anyone from Juul can tell me that these kids are above the age of 16, I would be shocked and I would probably call them a liar. But that's what you can see. This is the type of ads that you'll use. To add even more to that, if you go onto Instagram, you can see that all of these Instagram celebrities, Instagram models are being paid to advertise these substances. And you can also see this in commonly in things like music videos. You will see Juul devices, other e-cigarette devices popping up in things like DJ Khaled music videos, and it's really quite rampant through there. But again, it's because these are all not restricted. And for cigarettes, they were previously. This is obviously something that is an issue throughout North America, but it's also an issue here in Ottawa. This is from January of this year, uh, 2019, from a high school in Barhaven. Some of you may have actually read this article where a principal threatens to take the doors off of the bathrooms to prevent kids from being able to go in there in between classes and actually using these vaping devices. And I thought this was a little ridiculous, so I asked one of my friends who's a high school teacher in Smith's Falls, and I said to him, is this actually an issue? And he said to me, at least once a week he's kicking a kid out of class for smoking a e-cigarette device in class. And they are, yeah, and they are new devices that don't have that big plume of smoke anymore. So quite simply, he says what they do is they take a hit, they blow it into their hood, and you never would know. And so it's something that's so prevalent that they just, they give up. 
The, the staff cannot keep up with this, and it's just overwhelming for them, so they let it go. Um, it's sort of become mainstream. This is one of my favorite things I found in this talk. So imagine going to the jewel room and finding toilets. And this goes on and on and on. And so not only is nicotine affecting our kids' ability to make unique jokes, and they just all keep copying each other, it's obviously become mainstream. And once it's become cool, you know that these kids are going to have a difficult time stopping doing it. A really interesting study from a few years ago took these kids who said, yes, I use these e-cigarette devices, and they polled them and they said, do these devices contain nicotine? And 81% of them said no. So it's not only that it's mainstream and it's cool, they don't know what they're getting into. They don't know that they're becoming addicted to this substance. Bringing this slide back again, I'm going to bring your attention to that last note, just to give you guys an idea of where we are in society today, because I like to think we've made advances in 50 years. But in 2019, we have essentially equivalent numbers of people using e-cigarette devices as we did smoking cigarettes in 1976. That might even be a bigger issue than it was back then. These devices are not regulated. The nicotine content in a single jewel pod can range anywhere from one to two packs of cigarettes in equivalents for nicotine. There are kids that are using above one, two to three of these pods a day. That's the equivalence of two or three to six packs of cigarettes in a single day. Imagine the nicotine addiction to that. Try focusing in school when you're having those withdrawal symptoms. Imagine the development on that 16-year-old brain that nicotine is having. That's a major issue. From that, I'm going to step back. I'm going to leave you guys with that sort of thought, and I'm going to stop fear-mongering here for a little while. We're going to change gears now, and we're going to talk a little bit about vaping-associated lung injury, the main reason that most of us, I think, are here today. So vaping-associated lung injury, unless you've been living under a rock for the last three or four months, you've heard of this. You've seen the maps from the U.S. showing deaths across America. You've seen the CBC articles, the CNN articles. You may have even seen some of the social media campaigns that are going on. You may have even, for a certain population, be reading High Times. And you may see that even High Times has taken this and feels as though it's important for their users to know about. For a few of you that are actually familiar with Blue Light, which is a great recreational drug form where you can go online and figure out how to mix cathinones with cocaine safely, you can also see that there are topics and discussions about the warning people and warning these users about e-cigarettes and vaping-associated lung injury. You know that if our high-risk populations and our high-risk users are concerned about this, we should be concerned about it as eMERGE docs and be able to help these people. To give you guys a bit of an idea as to the actual landscape as to what we're seeing right now, the CDC updates every Thursday, and they haven't updated it yet. I was hoping to get today's most up-to-date evidence or uh, data in here. But looking at the actual outbreak of cases, so in total in the U.S. right now, there's 1,888 cases, and that's from all across 49 states. So it's not from a single subpopulation that we're seeing it. There have been 37 deaths that have been confirmed from these uh, lung, uh, vaping associated lung injury. And at this time, the CDC and the FDA have no idea what's causing it. It's a disease of the young. So the median age of patients that we're seeing with this illness is 24 years old. 70, 79%, so almost 80%, are under the age of 35. And 14% are going to be pediatric patients with a big population in the next six years after that. You can see from this graph here, it gives you a bit of an idea in terms of the increasing number of these cases that we're seeing. A small caveat for this, it's obviously a bit of a temporal relationship with increasing awareness. So you can see in June, that's really whenever this became sort of public eye in the media, and I think that's whenever you're seeing increasing awareness and increasing reporting. So take it at a bit of, take this graph as a little bit of that caveat in it, that that increase may not just be a relation to it starting there. This could have been going on for years before and we just didn't recognize it as a disease entity. It still gives you a nice graphic and a nice sort of visual representation of what we're seeing. So fortunately, with the CDC and the U.S. going through this, Health Canada finally provided a little guidance to our province. And two of our favorite humans, Minister Elliott and Premier Doug Ford, have finally decided to act on this a bit. And they've made it mandatory for public uh, institutions, public hospitals, to report these severe cases of vaping-associated lung injury. So we've got this epidemic that's going on. We've got cases. Now we have to report it. So how do we identify it? So Vaping-associated lung injury is a difficult disease process to identify from an eMERGE perspective. We're going to go over a few cases of it later in the talk, but I want to give you a sense of what the typical case will look like to begin with. So typically, as you guys can probably understand, vaping-associated lung injury is going to be something that's a... I'll give this a minute. Oh, God. Yeah, okay, that's it. <laughs> Perfect. 
just in case anyone was wondering where that person ran away from. Um, so the symptoms are related to this. So it's going to be a disease of the young and the healthy. Typically, vaping-associated lung injury has got a bit of a subacute onset. So the course is going to be over the course of days to weeks. Now, if you look online, there are fulminant case reports of fulminant disease, so people who get illness and get very sick within a couple of days. But that's not the typical. This is going to be something that builds over the course of time. Primarily, you're going to see respiratory symptoms, not surprisingly. Shortness of breath, cough, chest pain. But what may surprise you is that there's a predominance of GI symptoms as well. So abdo pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. It may also surprise you guys that these GI symptoms can be the presenting symptom. So very commonly, you will see GI complaints as the main visit to the emergency department or to their family physician before developing the respiratory symptoms. So don't let that throw you astray. Almost ubiquitously, all of these cases will see a physician at least once before they'll actually receive the diagnosis. And that's in keeping with that subacute onset and that subacute course. So be aware of that. On examination, people will typically be febrile. They'll be tachycardic. They're going to be hypoxic, tachypnic. And on exam, about 75% of cases so far will have diffuse respiratory crackles. It's unfortunate because that means that 25% of patients actually have had normal exams to this point. You can see that this is a bit of a difficult disease process for us to start picking up. So thank God we have labs and we have x-rays and imaging that can help us. And the labs, they don't at all. They're inconsistent. There's huge variance across this disease process. You will see cases with a white blood cell count that's as high as 40, and there are cases with white blood cell counts that are stone cold normal. You'll see that generally it'll have a neutrophil predominance when you have that white count, so you can't rely on eosinophilia or leukocytosis to give you that helpful um, lean one way or the other. Your inflammatory markers, again, they're not very helpful. They're mildly elevated, and the same goes with things like LFTs. You can see some mild transaminitis, but you do not see other lab markers that can help convincingly give you this diagnosis. Imaging really is where the diagnosis is made, that in with your history. So even in the disease process early on with imaging, it can be normal. So again, you will see lots of cases with normal x-rays to begin with, but typically whenever you start to have major symptoms and you see abnormal... You start to see abnormal vital signs, you're going to have bilateral opacifications on that chest x ray. A recent uh, case series that was published in a radiology journal um, shows typical x rays, and it shows some x rays of what we would see in this disease process. And what you'll see is this is the classic x ray. So, no clear consolidations, bilateral airspace disease, increased interstitial markings. But again, it's variable. You'll see a focal consolidation. You'll see really severe cases with, air, um, uh, with imaging findings of diffuse airway disease. CT scan can really help you with this diagnosis. If you see a nonspecific x-ray in a patient who's vaping and you're concerned about it, a CT scan is very reasonable to help you delineate this um, uh, lung injury further. You're going to see typically ground glass opacifications. And there's this classic crazy paving pattern that radiologists refer to. And what that is is ground glass opacifications and thickening of the interlobular septums. It's apparently got a very classic appearance on high-res CT. So it may be something that you see whenever you get this report. Here's what some of the images um, from CTs can look like to give you an idea of how diffuse the injury to these lungs can be from this process. So we have a nonspecific onset, a nonspecific exam, nonspecific labs, x-ray findings that are variable. How do we actually diagnose this? Thankfully, the CDC has given us a little bit of a guideline for this. So they have two diagnoses. So they have confirmed and probable. For a confirmed case of vaping-associated lung injury, what you need is history of vaping or smoking an e-cigarette device in the last 90 days. Add that to any opacification on any form of imaging. And then add that to no evidence of a respiratory infection. What does that mean? That means that you need to have a negative influenza screen, a negative respiratory uh, PCR screen, and any other screen that the clinician thinks is necessary, including things like bronchiavioli lavage, um, sputum cultures, to rule out a bacterial infection. If you have all three of those things, you have a confirmed case of vaping-associated lung injury. What about a probable case? So a probable case, because I don't think that we're going to get all that back in the emergency department. But so what about a probable case? Same idea. Smoking within the last 90 days of vaping or e-cigarette device. Add it to some pulmonary infiltrates. And this time, add it to a positive screen. If you have a positive screen for an infection, but the clinician thinks that that infection is not the main cause of their symptoms and their findings, then that's a probable case of vaping-associated lung injury. This is something that's going to be really difficult for us to be able to clearly diagnose in the emergency department. 
but it may be important for us to obviously identify this and allow our rest, or sort of direct them towards the people that can make this diagnosis. So we have this disease, but what's actually causing it? And as I touched on earlier, we have no clue. No one knows exactly what this disease process is. There are tons and tons of theories out there, but we do know a few things it's not. So it's not infection mediated. So there's been no evidence to suggest that vaping makes you prone to a certain viral or bacterial infection or, um, or, or parasite or anything weird or wonderful like that that's causing this. We know that about 84% of the cases, the user reports THC as the substance that they were vaping. But again, that's not across the board and they can't clearly link that. There are lots of theories as to why THC might be the common one. And in the US, you can imagine this is more likely to be the, the black market. In Canada, a little bit different, obviously, with regulation. Um, but there are many compounds that are found in these um, THC um, substances. So things like flavorants, like diacetyl, which has been sort of uh, associated with popcorn lung previously. You get these organic compounds that are used as uh, dissolvents for the THC, the nicotine. Those have been postulated as a possible cause, but never linked. And then there's heavy metals. So things like nickel, tin, lead. But again, nothing is just across the board being shown to be related to this. There's a prominent thought that this is related to adulterated products, so product that's from the black market. And again, it's really important for us to understand this aspect of it. It could be this. The CDC does recommend that you should not be using anything that you've obtained from the street, from your friends, or adulterated yourself. But at the same time, this has not been shown in every case. There are people who have bought very legitimate devices that have become unwell. And if you are a company and you have a really profitable device that may be killing people, but you can blame it on something else, you're going to do everything you can to blame that on something else. So you really need to know where these sources are coming from to be able to reliably believe that that's actually an adulterated product is the main cause. So just keep that in mind when you're reading articles and things around that. A really recent article, actually October last month out of the New England Journal of Medicine, was an interesting article that took lung biopsies from a case series of vaping-associated lung injuries. They wanted to identify a disease process and something that they could say, this is related, this is what is causing all these illnesses. Unfortunately, they weren't able to do that. But what they did find was really interesting. In our more moderate cases, they were seeing evidence of things like organizing pneumonias, lipoid pneumonias, eosinophilic pneumonias. In more moderate cases, they were seeing things like hypersensitivity pneumonitis. And in the really severe cases, they were seeing things like diffuse alveolar hemorrhage and ARDS. This is a really broad spectrum of illness. And there was nothing that was so high that they thought it was the main culprit. They postulate a little bit that this might be more of an umbrella term. Vaping-associated lung injury is an umbrella term for a set of disease processes that vaping makes you more prone to, as opposed to a single compound, a single item that's causing a single disease process. And so maybe that's more what we're looking at, is that vaping is a risk factor for these other diseases. But we don't know that. Now, some of these things on here, probably you're familiar with. Some of them you've never heard of. I had never heard of a lipoid pneumonia before. I looked it up, and I've forgotten it already. But there are a few things on here that you kind of know that you've studied at some point in time. And I'm going to use some really brief cases here to take a look and to see. Yes. <laughs> I was hoping that would work. Um, <laughs> to um, use some of these other disease processes to help guide us in our management. I'm so proud of myself for that. <laughs> um, right. um, so case number one, I'm not going to try to hide these cases or make them really difficult to understand. So case one is going to be about a moderate case of vaping-associated lung injury. So you've got a 21-year-old female. She's presenting with one week of cough, fever, and night sweats. She was seen over in Gatineau recently. She had an x-ray. X-ray was normal, told that she has a virus. But you guys are all here today, and you guys are all learning about vaping. And when she represents, you ask, have you been vaping? And she admits to vaping. She's been doing it for the last two months. She just started. And she kind of looks awful. She's got a bit of a fever. She's 38.7. Her heart rate's elevated. She's a little hypoxic on room air. And on exam, you hear diffuse respiratory crackles. You get an x-ray, and this is what you see. Now, this may sort of look familiar to the x-ray I showed you guys earlier, but some of you might look at this and sort of say, you know, I've seen that process before. I've seen that x-ray, that story before. And it kind of comes to you, and you're like, ah, that's bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia, or boop. Um, <laughs> now, boop has been changed recently, and it should actually be COP, or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. And that's something that's a disease process that I hope most of us in here sort of know, and we can use to help guide us in our management of these cases, because they're very similar in terms of the the actual treatment. So organizing pneumonia is in two types, actually. So there's the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, which is what we talk about commonly, and that's sort of our idiopathic form. That was formerly what was known as BOOP. 
And then there's actually this secondary organizing pneumonia. It's the same disease process, it's just that you identify as an inciting trigger, something like an exposure or a new drug that caused it. Cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, it's a type of interstitial lung disease. It affects your distal bronchioles, your respiratory bronchioles, um, and the alveolar ducts and walls. And really, we don't know what causes the idiopathic form. There's a postulation that it could be related to microaspiration, but we don't know. We do know in the secondary types that it's related to some exposure. And that's really where we're seeing this vaping-associated lung injury fall into. This is typically a disease of the middle age, so you might not think of it generally in our younger patient populations that come in with similar symptoms, but it's important to kind of ask in that nonspecific x-ray about new exposures, things of that nature. The presentation, this is going to look familiar to you guys. Gradual onset subacute course over the days and weeks, mainly respiratory complaints. They'll have seen physicians before, and this is really classically described by people as like, this is, I've had this pneumonia for two months, it's not resolving. It's that classic story of I've had antibiotics and I still have symptoms. Typically they're febrile, typically they're uh, tachycardic, hypoxic, tachypneic, and their exam is going to have diffuse respiratory crackles. Your investigations, they're not going to be too helpful. Your white blood cell count's usually normal, your inflammatory markers are only mildly elevated, and your x-rays are going to look similar to what we see with vaping-associated lung injury. So you can see the common themes in these two presentations. Now, Part of my job here today, I think, is to make sure that everyone's a good emergency physician. So I really advocate that if you see a 21-year-old female with a cough, infiltrates on x-ray, and the febrile, probably should treat them with a little bit of antibiotics to cover for a pneumonia. If you find that this story is atypical, and if you think the x-ray looks like something like an organizing pneumonia, like a moderate vaping-associated lung injury, this is where you start to consider the treatment for this, and that would be steroids. Most of these cases have been steroid responsive so far. In mild cases, oral steroids have been shown to be effective without patient management. In severe cases, IV steroids. This is not a decision that you should be making alone as an emergency physician, though. This is something to discuss with your respiratory colleagues, to discuss with your internal medicine colleagues, to ensure that if you think this is a vaping-associated lung injury, that they're going to have some good follow-up or seen in the emergency department, depending on how severe their symptoms are. But that is the main treatment for this. You're going to cover with antibiotics to prevent missing any sort of major infection, and you're going to have that consideration of steroids, and your job is that identification piece of this potentially being the diagnosis. Case two is a little bit more dicey. Case two is a 19-year-old male. He's brought in by ambulance with progressive respiratory distress. He was seen by his family doc a few days ago, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, had a cough, was started in a Z-pack for pneumonia. Went home, just kept getting worse. Progressive symptoms, shortness of breath, cough, fever, and comes in and looks really awful. Heart rate's 130, his respirate's 35, his sats are 91% on non-rebreather, um, and he looks bad. He's got diaphoresis, indrawing, diffuse crackles. Now, you're a good doctor again. You were here, you were listening to me today. So on this guy's last breath as he's about to go into hypoxic respiratory failure, you ask him about vaping, and he says he's been vaping for a long time, and it couldn't possibly be related to that. Um, he unfortunately answers your question and then proceeds to stop breathing, and you have to intubate him. And this is what you see. You can see this is actually x-rays from a vaping-associated lung injury in the U.S. from two days before and then post-intubation. This is the type of disease process and how quickly some of these can actually progress. That x-ray on your guys' right um, may make you think of another disease process, and classically this is going to make you think of ARDS. Our severe cases of vaping-associated lung injury develop into ARDS or diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, and we need to be comfortable managing this in these patients who go into a hypoxemic respiratory failure. The pathophysiology of ARDS, it's an acute lung injury, causes fluid in the interstitium in the alveoli, it impairs your gas exchange, it decreases that pulmonary compliance, it increases your pulmonary arterial pressure. This has a lot of effects, so you get VQ mismatch, so you get um, uh, failure of oxygenation. You're going to have high airway pressure, so you're going to get barotrauma related to that worsening the lung injury, and you're going to get pulmonary hypertension, which as we know, can really affect our hemodynamic status and can be difficult to manage in an intubated patient. The causes of ARDS are wide-ranging, so sepsis, aspiration, pneumonia, trauma, massive transfusion, but now we have to start considering vaping as part of a cause for people who present with ARDS. It's really important for us up front to differentiate this from a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and in these cases of vaping, it's going to be pretty easy because it's generally going to be a younger patient who's presenting. But in ARDS and older patients, it's important to get that history of no PND orthopnea, no fluid overload on exam. Um, take a look with your ultrasound to make sure that they've got good cardiac contraction, make sure that the ECG doesn't show an ACS. So really being aware of that, that that is a main differentiating point because the x-rays can look really similar. 
ARDS, the imaging findings will be what you saw. So diffuse airspace disease, you have um, alveolar opacities, the CT scan is going to show patchy consolidation. These imaging studies look awful. And this is another one just to give you an idea of what it looks like. This, again, is a vaping-associated lung injury. This kid actually ended up going on VV ECMO, um, and that's a common theme that we're seeing with a lot of these injuries. Now, I touch on ARDS because I wanted to touch a little bit on the ARDSNET protocol and the lung protective strategy of ventilation. Hopefully, many of you will know ARDS, and our ICU colleagues um, will know the ARDSNET protocol quite well. Um, but I wanted just to give you guys a little bit of a, a sort of a, a rehashing on the subject. So ARDSNET was a study, I think it was done back in 2000. It was published in NGEM, and it was a lung protective strategy, ventilation strategy, that actually showed an 8% decrease in mortality at 180 days, uh, reduced the length of ventilation in the ICU by two days, and had a number needed to treat of nine for um, mechanical ventilation or assistance at uh, 28 days. So some pretty good findings. This is something that's used pretty commonly and all of our respiratory therapists are quite familiar with. How you define these people and how you identify someone who's at risk or should be placed on this uh, protocol are people who come in with what looks like ARDS. So bilateral pulmonary infiltrates, no evidence of left atrial hypertension or essentially cardiogenic pulmonary edema and then a PaO2 to FiO2 less than 300. That's your minimum criteria for ARDS, is that PaO2 to FiO2 of less than 300. And this would be one of the few times in the emergency department that I think it's important for us to actually have an arterial blood gas, is to identify that PaO2. I've only done that a few times in residency, and every time it's really helped solidify a diagnosis for me. So if you see an X-ray in a case like this where you're concerned, you can either do it yourself, but our RTs are fantastic at this and very comfortable getting ABGs for us, and it can really give us that extra information we need. Now, I bring this up because, yes, our RTs are going to be familiar with this, and yes, they're fantastic, but they may not always use the ARDSNET protocol. The ARDSNET protocol requires an actual extra step, and that's to measure the patient's actual height to calculate their predicted body weight. That allows for you to then link your FiO2 to your PEEP and allow for you to titrate to adequate oxygenation in a way that's protective for the lungs and helps to reduce that lung injury and mortality down the line. That's the main thing that I wanted to talk to you about here today because if you have a case like this and you can identify this, you should ask our respiratory therapist to start this and make sure that they actually go and do the measurement itself because it may not be important whenever Dr. Hickey is going to be coming down at noon on a Wednesday but at midnight on a Thursday, something like that, where it could be six hours before you get that appropriate advanced strategy, you can make a major change in this person's outcome. The last case here, and I promise we're almost done, is the case you guys are going to see most often in the eMERGE and probably the one that you're most interested in hearing about. So that's our anxious patient. So a 26-year-old male. He's coming in in the middle of flu season with a cough, sore throat, subjective fever. He admits to daily vaping and nicotine use. Um, his vitals are rock solid. His exam is completely normal and he was watching CNN, and he was really, really concerned. He was waiting in the waiting room. He went online. He searched this, and he sort of saw this ad that vaping's going to kill you, and now he's really anxious. So what do you tell this patient? What do we do? Do we need to change our practice? I spoke with our respirologists around this, and the answer to that question is ask the history, but otherwise you do not need to change your practice substantially. If they're well, with a normal exam and normal vitals, it is far more likely that Valley is not going to be their diagnosis and that they're going to be okay. There's no indication that because you vape, you need to have a chest x-ray if everything else looks well. Make sure you give them good return, return instructions, though. So if these patients are coming in and that's their concern, tell them if they get worse to come back in because it's a gradual onset. People will be seen at least once beforehand, typically before they get the diagnosis, so let them know that that's the case. Here today, there's no indication for us to do any imaging or any testing. But if you get worse, make sure you do come back. And again, let people know, let the physician that sees you know that you're vaping and you've been seen before. Counsel them to stop vaping. Remember, I talked to you guys about this earlier. Vaping is not, like, it's not 95% safer than cigarettes. It's still a nicotine addiction. There are still risks associated with it. So try and counsel them to cut back. Try and counsel them to use other devices if they're using it for a nicotine replacement therapy. Use the Adam Quinn rule. So if these patients do come back, and if they're having worsening of their symptoms, consider adding something to what was done before. So these are the ones we're adding that x-ray, potentially considering some blood work might give you a bit more information. And of course, if they have a, um, sorry, of course, if they have any abnormal findings on exam or physical exam or vitals, then most definitely consider that x-ray at that point in time. To quickly summarize the strategies for all three of our cases, with the well patient, just reassurance is the biggest strategy. Maintain a healthy suspicion, ask about vaping, consider the chest x-ray if you're concerned, and beware of that patient with multiple visits. 
In our moderate cases, our patients with abnormal vitals, with abnormal imaging, treat them as a normal respiratory complaint. So cover them initially with antibiotics. Be a good eMERGE doc. But make sure if you've identified this as a potential risk, talk with our respirology colleagues. They're happy to discuss this because it's an interesting process for them. If they need to be admitted, internal medicine would be a good one to have a discussion with. And make sure that you pass that information of vaping along. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. It's going to take a few days for those respiratory panels to come back. But if that is po or if those are negative and you have a confirmed case, that needs to be reported, and steroids is the treatment for that. Critically ill, it's pretty simple. Have broad-spectrum antibiotics like you would up front. And your patients who are being intubated and they look like they're a septic shock picture, many of us are going to be considering our systemic steroids already. So in a case like this with that history and potential, definitely start it then. Talk with your respiratory therapist about the lung protective strategy, ARDSNAP protocol, and then understand that some of these cases, intubation doesn't fix all. Some of these cases need to progress to VV ECMO, and at some point in time, it's very possible that we could see one of these patients come to our eMERGE. Final summary, and we'll open it up for questions after this. The biggest thing from today, please start asking this. You're 10 times more likely to see an adolescent patient coming in, um, admitting to vaping, than you are to see them admitting to smoking. And I guarantee you, all of us are asking about smoking, drug use, ETOH, and I have completely changed, and I will start asking vaping. Funny enough, I have not had anyone who's admitted to it yet, but I will find somebody that vapes here soon. <laughs> um, if you have a case where you actually can meet the um, minimum criteria for a probable case, please do report that. But otherwise, just pass that along to our internal colleagues and say, I have a suspicion that this is the disease process. If they're positive, it needs to be reported because it's important for us to understand how many cases there are and to help get a better sense of this in Canada. If they're well, usual management. If they require an admission and you suspect Valley, antibiotics, consider the steroids, talk with our specialists, and finally, counsel your patients along the risks of vaping. You guys are now well educated in the public health issues that come along with vaping. So make sure that whenever you are talking with your patients, take that 30 seconds to try and help improve their outcomes and their long-term outcomes. With that, I'd like to acknowledge a few people. So a local respirologist, Dr. Smita Packhale, who's actually on the American Thoracic Society sort of task force for vaping-associated lung injury. Um, she was um, very, very helpful with producing this talk. Dr. Irvin Mayers, who is a respirologist from Edmonton with a special um, interest in nicotine replacement therapy and now as well uh, Valley. Uh, Matt Lipinski, my supervisor, and Simeon Mitchell, who I promised I'd throw in here because he listened to my talk and gave some feedback the other day. Um, and with that, I'll open up for questions.